The talk today is going to run around three different uh, small talks by uh, myself, Adam and Stefan. And then we have some questions already from people who have put them in the past few days. So we'll start off with those. If you have any questions, just put them in the Q&A uh, side and then uh, we'll try and answer them throughout the session. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's useful and hopefully you will learn a lot from uh, the time and effort we put in the past few years to develop our own career um, so that hopefully you can do the same. Uh, right, so, um, so this talk is uh, developed by uh, QuestMed. So we are a high quality single best answer question bank. We try and move away from niche irrelevant questions. We focus on diagnosis, investigations and management. And people have said that we are the most relevant to current UK medical exams. Got lots of questions, flashcards and notes. And next year, hopefully, uh, we will add another 1,500 questions, a PSA question resource for finals, mobile app, and some new progress tracking features. So uh, hopefully, in a few months' time, we'll have all that up and running, and they'll be very useful for people the next academic year. Um, we have had loads of lectures these past couple of months, uh, maybe the past two months. So all of them can be found on our Facebook page. They're all free. Anyone can sign up. Um, so bit.ly slash tutorials questmed. And then there are going to be a few in the next couple of weeks um, as we try and wrap up as people are finishing their exams. But if there are more uh, interested, we will make some more as well. We're happy to do that. Um, yeah, so if you want to access the recordings and the live lecture signups for the next week or so, or the next couple of weeks rather, go to bit.ly slash tutorials questmed and then or search on Facebook for questmed tutorials. So I hope that's useful. Um, so what we're going to cover today is our, as I said, our own experiences of navigating through this field that causes a lot of anxiety. Um, talking about principles on how to get started through our own experience. We've made lots of mistakes. Uh, I don't know about the other guys, I'm sure they have, but I certainly have. Um, so we'll talk about that. And really trying to frame this in the way of your own career ambitions, because everyone is so different. Everyone has different careers, you know, and maybe it doesn't seem so obvious when you're at medical school, but the more you qualify. So us three, or maybe up three or four years after we've just qualified. So we're at a stage where people are now differentiating and it really does make a difference in terms of uh, when you are in a different career path how important this sort of thing is. So I think that's important to, to take into consideration. And finally, the focus on your own well-being uh, and not to get too caught up in what everyone else is doing. So it's very important, not just for medical school, but for being a junior doctor in life as well. Um, so based on some of the questions, I've decided just to quickly run through some very key factual points as we go along um, before we start. So audit and research are two different things. Um, audit is a way of finding out whether what you're doing essentially follows um, best practice. So the question you're asking is, is our current practice consistent with best practice? So are we doing, are we treating sepsis, for example, in the same way that the national guidelines say we should within the right time frame, for example? Whereas research is trying to answer the question, what should be best practice? I.e., you're trying to increase the sum of knowledge and you are trying to evaluate what is best. So essentially, you're to a certain extent trying to develop guidelines that are um, can be audited against. And that's how to think about the difference between research and audit. Um, Another question that people were asking was about sort of what first author, last author stuff is. Um, so I just thought to put that in to start off with. Um, so normally um, the first author is someone who does a lot of the work to start off with, uh, tends to write the manuscript um, or most of it, depending on how senior you are. Um, you may not do all of it when you're a medical student, even if you are first author. So it depends. You tend to liaise between everyone. You keep things moving and make sure to complete things. Um, the last author tends to be the PI or, and or principal investigator probably a supervisor much much more likely to be a supervisor and it's essentially their name by the paper they're the ones that have the responsibility at the end uh, of uh, the publishing to the outside world and then it's their name by it basically and the second author tends to help the first author is also very very involved may write some bits but it is not as involved as the first author or may not write as much uh, one other question that people asked was how much work you need to do to become an author is very variable it will depend on each supervisor, department, the nature of the work, and also depends on the journal itself. So there's no hard and fast rules. Um, it will depend on every single person or lab or supervisor. So um, some people may just be acknowledged, some people may be an author. So um, there's no real rules for it, really, it depends. Um, one other thing in, in the context of well-being, as we we're talking about was, we, we, initially, we definitely put the title up uh, deliberately to potentially tap into your concerns about publishing in a way that's productive 
and not in a way to scare you. So we really wanted to try and show you this concept of how people sort of talk about their publications and how great they are. But in fact, a lot of, if you go really deep down, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, cracks beneath the surface. So we're gonna talk a bit about how useful publishing is, but also sort of how important it is to focus on your own career. A lot of this can be luck, not necessarily a reflection of the best candidates, but um, it does help. So don't get too caught up in the rat race, especially if you are uh, prone to get worried about what other things other people are doing. Um, so I myself, I qualified from medical school with one letter to the editor, and it also came after the FPAS applications ended, so it was completely useless. So, so really, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine now, I've done a lot of stuff, so actually, I was okay. Life went on, it wasn't a problem. But you know, it was, it, was, it was helpful to get a foundation which I had developed in medical school, which I'll talk about later. Um, and finally, they're not the be all end all. You can get into specialty training posts with no PubMed ID publications. I know someone who got into neurology, which is thought to be very academic, didn't have a publication. It's really more important to learn from them rather than the actual name of what's, what you have. Um, and a lot of things do depend on the interview which tends to be based on your clinical skills, your ability to reflect, and a holistic mix of teaching, audits, and presentations. So it's all about the holistic understanding of what you are as a doctor. And as a doctor, you are a clinician, you are an academic to a certain extent, and you are a, um, a teacher. So your understand their understanding of what you are as a person is more important than um, just a simple name on a paper, for example. So that's just the thoughts I, the thoughts I wanted to convey to start us off. So to start off, uh, let's have uh, Dr. Stefan Mitrosinovich, who is one of the co-founders at QuestMed and is an amazing individual who I've worked with for many, many years and is going to tell us more about his work uh, in the past. So I'm going to stop sharing there. I'll leave it to you, Stefan. Okay, brilliant. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to get a feel for what kind of year groups we have. So if anyone can just post in the chat, one, two, three, four, five, six, or if they're already graduated, just to find out what year you're in just so that I can kind of gauge um, how to level the talk. Okay. okay. Brilliant. So we're gonna start in talking about um, how to get started in publishing and what it actually means. And for me, very much the the key take home for me is stay persistent and stay keen. So that's gonna be a, a, a guiding principle throughout my talk and I will kind of touch on it and why that's so important to me. Um, and I think that it all really began because I was really, really interested in research uh, from the very beginning and I really wanted to get involved but I didn't know where to start and how to start. And I went to all these talks from uh, these big academics and from the Royal College of Surgeons thinking, you know, how will I get published? What can I, what are the secrets? And actually there, in my perspective, there's no secret at all. It's just a matter of being persistent and doing what you're passionate. So, finding something you're passionate about. Doesn't matter what it, at all what it is. Doesn't matter if you're gonna end up actually going into the field um, or end up doing a PhD and what you're interested in. I ended up starting doing a lot of work in neurosurgery and it's something that I was very, very interested in in med school. And now I'm currently a orthopedic trainee. So there are some overlaps, particularly specifically with the spinal research, but my, my focus was maybe mainly neurovascular. Um, and it doesn't matter at all. Uh, at the end of the day, when you apply for any academic posts, they just care about your academic work. Doesn't matter which journals you published in. Obviously it helps if you've produced high impact research in the specialty that you're interested in, but they appreciate any candidate that has gone through it and gone through the effort of getting their name, getting their name out in the academic world, getting grants accepted. Um, and I guess the biggest thing is as a, as a junior kind of medical student starting out is finding out what, what other people are doing, what's actually feasible. Um, you might want to do a big randomized controlled trial, but realistically uh, at that point in your career, it's just not going to be possible. So look at what your consultants are doing. Um, look at if there's anything that you find interesting in what they're doing. Stop and start talking to them. Everyone loves talking about their research. And um, that's always a good icebreaker when you're on your rotations and the consultants will definitely remember your name and remember you. Um, if you are in a research group uh, or in a hospital where there isn't much research going on, 
you can always look outside. So I'll talk about my um, kind of what I did in the end, and I ended up going uh, to the United States and doing research out there purely because I just was passionate about what they were doing and I wanted to get involved. And as long as you show interest, as long as you show that you're persistent, keep emailing, keep getting in contact, those things can happen. They will work out for you. Um, but it's obviously much, much easier for you to push for something that you're passionate about than you know, just trying to get some points in your application. So I started off in my BSc year thinking, okay, great, this is the, my year off that I'm gonna be able to do research, I'm gonna focus 100% on my research project, which I did, to the unfortunate uh, scores of my other topics, but that's fine. I ended up getting a best dissertation prize for my uh, immunology BSc and got nominated for the best project um, in the whole life sciences department. Now, surely you're thinking, okay, this guy's got the best prize. He should be able to get published. Should be no problem at all. Well, it's not quite that easy. So I was awarded all these, I was given this award and I asked my supervisor, listen, you know, everyone's really, really happy with the work I've done. How do we get published from here? My work, you know, I've, I've written a dissertation. We can just, you know, trim it and put it into a publication. And my supervisor very much was like, okay, well, let's spend another four months. Let's get some more data. Let's perfect the pu publication. Let's, you know, make it really, really good. And I, you know, had already given so much of my time for this project. And I thought, you know, this is, was not going to go anywhere. Um, and I was quite uh, disappointed, to be honest. And I'm not saying that this is how it's going to be for everyone. I know a lot of my uh, colleagues and friends who ended up getting published from their BSc work. Um, and that's definitely a great place to get started because you have the time, you have the uh, flexibility, you have a team behind you that will help you get that stuff done. Um, but even, even then, do not um, be discouraged. Because I ended up messaging uh, a research group out in uh, the New York Presbyterian Hospital saying that I wanted to work with them, work on their neurovascular work. And they were very, very receptive. And they said, sure, come out uh, and we'll see what we can do together. Um, and I spent two months out in the New York in their hospital and working with the, this publication that uh, was a clinical and surgical application, so smart classes. Um, it wasn't a very big impact journal, but it was my work. It was, I was the first author, uh, and I worked with a great, wonderful team, um, and they really, really appreciated me going out there, not necessarily being paid to be there, um, and I put 110% into that project because I was really, really passionate about it. And I met a lot of contacts and I had a lot of fun. And that's the most important thing when you're working on anything academic, you wanna make sure that whatever you're doing is fun and you're enjoying it. Cause there's no point in working on a paper or a big review that is taking you all your time, taking you away from your clinical medicine and that you're not able to get any output from it or that you feel like it's a chore. Um, and since I was out there, since I met everyone from the neurosurgical department, I was able to network and make up future collaborations. So that first research group that I was with allowed and opened the doors uh, for me to then work with different research groups out um, in Stanford and also then in the UK. And that made context for me uh, with my clinical work also in, in the future. And you know, I was a third year medical student at that point. I was probably the dumbest person in the room when I started off. Everyone had been postgraduate medicine because in the US they do the four years of preclinical medicine. Um, and you know, it didn't matter. I was then at the end of the day, at the end of my placement, I was the smartest person in the room about what I was specifically looking at. Um, and everyone was coming to me and asking me questions about the using smart classes, using digital technology in the operating room. And that really, really uh, made, made, made my time there really, really valuable. And it's very easy to get in conversations with other people because you're talking to other researchers, other uh, primary investigators, and you're saying, well, what are you working on? What's, what's your research for focus? And they love talking about their own work. And they will obviously ask you afterwards, what are you working on? What are you doing here? And you're the expert on what you're writing on and no one can take that away from you. Um, and that's a really, really good way of you know, building future relationships. So I ended up getting quite a lot of publications from the same group, um, worked with Jeff Applebloom a lot, uh, and then ended up uh, you know, connecting ties with uh, researchers in Stanford, researchers in Belgium, and also with the original group at Columbia. Um, so I think that uh, Yasmin will talk a, a little bit as well, the importance of getting a supervisor and getting someone under your wing who will guide you um, and 
once you get that first publication out with a research group, it makes a huge difference. So again, stay passionate, persistent, and keep having fun. Those are the important things. You might get worried about your applications. You might get worried about the points you need. Um, and you know, I was looking at my, uh, the comparison of the, the students that were working in the US and you know, some of them had 15 publications or 20 publications. And I was thinking, how do I even compete against these guys? And honestly, it doesn't matter. It's not all a numbers game. It's much, much more important about what you learn and the relationships that you build from the experience. If you really, really are worried about points and you really want to get publications out and you don't really care how, there are some things you can do for quote unquote easy points. Be very, very wary of anyone that hands you a paper that's almost done. And you'll get this a lot of the time from senior registrars or consultants that are saying, oh, you know, I've, I've worked on this for the last several months. Unfortunately, the medical student left or my fellow left and it's a very small amount of work and you'll publish it and you'll get, you'll get your name on it. Perfect. Realistically, a lot of those times, those are hot potatoes. They, you don't want to touch them because they will, you'll, you have to ask yourself, why has it not been submitted already? What's the problem here? Why, why are you not asking me to do this for you? Um, and ultimately you have no control over that paper because you're coming in at, to a late stage uh, and you have no uh, say on where your name comes in the authorship line and it will always be more time than you think it will be. So I always say, whenever anyone talks about a project, have in mind what you think, how long it's gonna take and then times it by three because realistically, when everyone comes back with the edits uh, and you know what their comments are, it's gonna take you that much longer. So if you really wanna get easy points, it's very, very good to work with research collaborative groups. So I can't really speak from a medical perspective, but for the research side for surgery, there's a lot of great groups out there. So Star Surgeon, Global Surgeon have been working very, very well on getting medical students in, and they specifically only use medical students for most of their publications. Um, it's a big group, but it's a lot of data. So these works will give you high impact publications, but you, will be not, you won't be a named author, it will be a collaborative. So your name will appear on PubMed, on research, on the search engines. So it will count towards points. Um, but you have to be wary that if, people, if that's your only work, people will, will pick up on it and will ask you, well, what did you really do for this research? And ultimately it would have been a bit of data collection. It won't be much more than that. And then that will not be as valuable as if you had done at least one original work. Um, specifically for surgery, case reports may not be included in your interviews. Um, and that's more important for your core surgical interviews or for your specialty training interviews. Um, for the foundation years, any application work doesn't matter if it's a case report. I think for medicine, case reports are still accepted. So by all means, if you have something that's interesting, uh, we had recently had a case of a guy that had shotgun wounds and had a, a shotgun pellet go and embolize into his heart. I thought that was an extremely interesting case report. It's not gonna add any points, but I thought it was still an extremely valuable talking point, something that I really, really enjoyed writing because it was a very interesting paper. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're doing, uh, looking at starting up a new project. And, you know, you never know where these research, research collaborations will go because for COVID surge, we ended up getting a publication in The Lancet just a few weeks ago, um, looking at uh, coronavirus and how it impacts surgery. Um, and I mean, you can't, you can't get these publications out without uh, being part of a big group. Um, we also had uh, the work that was done in our hospital for the recovery trial recently get released in the pub press uh, about dexamethasone for coronavirus. And I was part of a ward that was working on that. Um, so as long as you're getting involved in these big collaboratives, they might not be a lot of work or they might be quite a bit of work, but you know, they can come out to, get, to give you some really big publications. Um, so this kind of comes on to the next line of, you need to find a group of people that you're gonna work with. So everything's better when you're working together. You know, you can be the Lone Ranger, you can write something by yourself, but it will be a lot more work than if you start working together. So I re realized that after working with my um, research groups in the US, and I realized that you can achieve so much more with a group of people from the same research group that have similar interests. And I couldn't do that um, with uh, the departments in the UK, but I ended up doing my own thing with the medical school. So we ended up creating this thing called uh, UCL Be The Change, and um, we touched on audits, we touched on research uh, publications, but we also, there's another, another way of getting published which is called quality improvement. And what quality improvement is essentially is monitoring um, one specific output, uh, whether that be, so for us, it was looking at, um, uh, one of our publications was looking at uh, newborn uh, babies and mothers and how they were coping with uh, their confidence in taking care of those, their newborn babies. 
and we ended up adding new things to the um, maternal ward, new resources, new information leaflets, new training resources that was all done in partnership with the medical students and also with the, um, with the nurses and the midwives there. And we were able to show that we increased a parent's um, confidence in taking care of their kids, not giving as many calls to the ward and not bringing their kids in as much. And that was one of our kind of pivotal projects. We ended up doing another four projects and we presented this as a national um, quality improvement uh, competition and ended up taking first place. And while we only managed to get one publication out of it, the experience and the uh, research that kind of work that we did ended up being a grant that we got, which was successful, which is a huge talking point for interviews. Uh, and we ended up getting this first prize. And even if we didn't get the first prize, if anyone came into your interview and saw this on your CV, they would definitely ask about it. And they'd be more interested about this than any other paper that you've written. Um, so I guess the take homes are find something you're passionate about, stick to it. Network, network, network. And I cannot stress that enough. Find people that are passionate, just as like you. Doesn't matter if they're in a different country, doesn't matter a different partner or just next door to you, your friends and uh, colleagues from medical school and take ownership for your work, be the expert. Um, no, no, in no time you will then start building up an academic portfolio where people will come to you with questions and they will ask you to start joining in their projects uh, and then you'll have to learn the uh, very difficult thing of saying no. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll take it from there. Thanks very much, Stefan. That was really, really interesting. Um, so um, that's great. So obviously lots of stuff done over the years. So it's great. So I'm... Um, uh, we usually we're going to question later, but there's some couple of ones that are just are relating to exactly what you were talking about. One of them was like um, going to gain contacts for work in, in New York. Was that you elected or did you sort of cold call them? How did that work? It was a lot of cold calling. I'm not going to lie. So um, for my, for my BSC year, we had the longest summer um, and a lot of people took that time to go off and enjoy themselves. And I took a couple months uh, that I had eight weeks off and specifically emailed all the big hospitals or big academic centers that I found their research was very interesting and emailed the, the head uh, investigators from the papers and said, listen, I'm a medical student at UCL. I have a huge interest in neurology and neurosurgery. I'd love to come work with you or learn what you're doing in your lab. Um, you know, no costs, uh, don't have to pay me. I'm just passionate um, and happy to do a video conference or a call and we'll take from there. And I had one neurosurgeon who was very, very happy, said, you know, fine, come out. These are the, come out, let me know when you're coming. And I, you know, I don't know if he really uh, thought that I was going to come, but I took his word for it. And I said, listen, I'm coming these dates. I'll see you in your office at 5 a.m., which is what he told me. And we took it from there. And it was a, it was a start of something wonderful. Okay, it's very, very yeah. simple. 5 a.m. starts. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember the last time I've seen 5 a.m. Uh, uh, and then some other question was talking about research collaboratives. How do you find them? And do they count for FPAS points? Or do they count? I'm not sure. Like, uh, so, so for, so it depends. I think for FPAS, you specifically need to be a named author. Um, I put them in my FPAS application. And when they came to the portfolio station, uh, at least for my academic interviews, uh, they, they asked one question on it, which was, we don't see your name here. And I said, yes, I'm part of the collaborative. I did this much work. I did, you know, a month of data collection. It led to this publication. The outcomes of this publication were this, this, and this. Um, my work was uh, very, very important. And I applied for ethics for my, for the data research that I did, data collection I did. And they were very happy with that. And they took it on from there. It's a, it's a very sm small question they might ask, but you can always spin it into a way that works out for you. Cool. Um, for finding them, I think that it's just a matter of looking at the Royal Colleges, looking at the um, uh, Facebook groups or Twitter groups of the specialties that you're interested in. Um, I think that I touched on Star Surge, COVID Surge, and Global Surge, which are the ones that are from the same group of um, uh, surgeons that are essentially looking at getting medical students in uh, for high-impact publications. Um, I can't really comment on medical, um, medical research collaboratives, but I'm sure that there are definitely some out there. Great, sounds good. Um, okay, cool. So I think we'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much, Stefan. That's really, really good. If you can hang around, no you yeah, can I'll stick around for as long as I can. Okay. Uh, so I think now we will move on to Dr. Adam Ali. So thank you very much. So Adam Ali is a good friend of mine. We work together on lots of different projects. He is very, very big in medical education, big on the uh, big on the finals teaching scene, which he's done for a few years, and is genuinely one of the most engaging speakers uh, I've come across. 
Um, and yeah, very, very good. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And I'll try and answer stuff as we go along, but I'll leave the rest to uh, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Susan. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I'll share your screen as well. Can you see that? Yeah, we got it. Okay, great. Thanks for um, having me. Uh, my name is Adam. I am currently working as uh, an honorary, honorary registrar uh, in public health as part of the coronavirus response. Um, this at the top here is a copy paste of uh, a review that I did in Nature Drug Discovery. And I thought I'd just spend about 10, 15 minutes telling you some stories about my life and how I managed to cobble together a few papers. Um, me and uh, Yezen were talking about at the start of this kind of giving a talk about how to get published. Um, and I think there are other outcomes that matter besides just publication, which is why my title is not exactly just how to get published. Um, but I will take you through it all. Um, I'm going to try and provide what I think I would have liked to have received as a medical student, which is someone to tell me their story, how they got involved, and kind of their experiences. So I will, I'll try and do that today. Um, so just a bit about myself, I went to med school at UCL with uh, Stefan Yezin um, and I did a BSc in clinical sciences in 2014 um, and that was uh, awarded like first class, I was on the dean's list, so that was like my first taste of academic success really, um, because as I've written here, I really did not enjoy preclinical medicine at all and I didn't do that well. Um, I didn't do awful, but I didn't do that well. Um, and then I did my F1 at the Royal Free and my F2 at Barnet. Um, and I'm now an F3. I've actually not put it in here. So I'm an F3 now, which is great, which I could talk about for a long time as well. But to summarize it, essentially, um, I kind of been pushed into the F3 because I didn't get the job that I wanted, which I think is very important to talk about, which I'll talk about uh, in the course of this lecture. Um, and uh, it's been fantastic. Like I kind of wanted to take one anyway, but because I'm a very like rat race kind of guy, I'm proper like stuck in the hamster wheel and I'm just like, oh, I need to keep like going with training. Otherwise I'm going to fall out and die and become, you know, unemployed. So, th so th that I suffer from that. And if I had had the choice, I would have loved to have done an F3, but it has implications. In my F3, I've done cardiology and transplant at Harefield. I've done some general internal medicine at Luton. I've done a fair bit of A&E in about four different A&Es. And now I'm working in public health, which obviously is uh, uh, at Heathrow Airport, which is very, very fun and enjoyable. And I never would have thought I could do it. So it's very good. And I've had a lot of time off and I've made some good money. So that's my little shout out for F3s. But I'm sure some of you will do them. Um, yeah, so I didn't do that well in preclinical. I really, really hated it. I had no idea what they really wanted from us or what was being examined. And mo maybe 90% of it was clinically irrelevant. So that's my piece on preclinicals. I think it should be overhauled. Maybe that's because I didn't do well. Um, and then in my BSc, I did really well. That was like my first experience of being involved in research. Um, I got, well, I'll talk about my BSc later, but I managed to get three papers from that. Um, and I got merit in my fourth and final year of med school with some random prizes scattered throughout. Uh, some of them soft, some of them not so soft, some of them pretty good. I was very lucky to get a lot of what I did. Um, and I, I really like teaching. So I've been teaching uh, clinical medicine since I was a fifth year. So it's pretty much been five years. This is my uh, <laughs> underwhelming Facebook page. Um, I'm kind of considering what I want to do with the teaching thing. Obviously, coronavirus has changed everything. So um, yeah, if you're interested, just search Adam's teaching. I think it's Adam Ali teaching and give it a follow and you will be kept up to date with courses. Um, considering moving to Zoom, but we'll see how it goes. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the title of the talk was What Outcomes Matter? Uh, essentially, I think that you shouldn't uh, look at getting involved in research and projects as just getting published. There are other things that really matter. Um, and essentially, I've listed them here. And those are to be presenting your work. So I think someone asked earlier, what does presenting mean? Um, and you might have seen some of your friends or people in your med school doing that kind of archetypal pose with their poster at a conference. Um, so presenting your work can either be oral, as in giving a lecture or a talk, or a presentation, and generally oral presentations are more favoured and considered to be something that are more difficult to attain. Um, and then, once you're presenting your work, you want to be trying to get prizes. So for example, if you present at a conference, there's often going to be like 
a best paper prize, a best presentation, etc. And you really want to be trying to get prizes as well for the work that you do. And I'll talk about that later. And I see publication as the kind of final frontier on any given project. I think a really important distinction that needs to be made is between projects in basic sciences. So that's like lab work, like pipetting stuff and genotyping and that kind of thing, which is stuff I've done in the past. Um, animal work, for example, I've done that too. And clinical work, which is more like working with data, working with patients, audits. And in my humble experience, I would say clinical stuff is much, much, much easier to publish. Basic sciences is exceptionally difficult. Um, I spent a fair amount of time mixing with scientists and I felt sorry for them, man. Like their life is hard. Like publishing is very difficult. It's there's a bit of that like publish or perish kind of mentality. Uh, impact factor is important and a lot of people try and deny that. So I think it's very difficult for scientists. I think for clinicians, it's much easier. Okay, uh, so I just wanted to make a few cautionary notes. The first one I wanna say is don't hate the player, hate the game, yeah? So I'm here, I'm out here just trying to play the game, just trying to get a job that I want. Don't hate me, don't get upset. This is the way the game is and it's not necessarily correct. I didn't decide that getting papers and points and publications and prizes makes you a better candidate, but that is just the nature of the landscape at the moment. Um, I would say that these outcomes really do not make you a better doctor necessarily. Uh, so I was going to say they don't make you a better doctor and then I changed my mind. Um, they kind of don't make you a better doctor because you can kind of be on the ward and having to deal with a medical emergency or prescribing paracetamol for a four-year-old and you're just like, I literally don't know how to do this, literally. And your paper ain't going to help you, okay? Your prizes aren't going to help you. No one knows about those things when you're an F1, F2. And unless you go around like announcing what you've done, which is decent shout. But um, essentially, they don't really necessarily make you a better doctor. But I have had examples where I've been working and something I have literally done in research has manifested itself clinically and it's actually helped. Um, certainly case reports, for example, I can think of many. So one of the things I really love is <coughs> taking photographs and videos, as those of you who have come to my teaching will know, of patients with physical signs. That kind of stuff genuinely helps me day to day, like examining a murmur or finding a very interesting JVP sign or a scar or a rash. And then you see it in real life and you actually know what it is. Um, uh, yeah, so that so that kind of stuff does help. Um, I got a few glory stories. Like I remember I, I diagnosed a pancos tumor in A&E and that day I was very buzzing. So there are examples where this kind of stuff can help. Okay. The, the things, in my opinion, that make you a good doctor in the UK, from my limited experience, I've done F1, F2 and locums in lots of places, are comm skills and teamwork. And really teamwork is kind of just a proxy of, for comm skills. So as long as you're good at getting to know people, you're humble, people like to speak to you, you're friendly and just generally pleasant, I think you'll go very, very far. And that also holds true in the world of research. So uh, I think at this point, it's worth asking, why even bother putting in time and effort to try and achieve these outcomes of like prizes, presentations, publications? Uh, and I've got several reasons I'm going to take you through. So the first one is that these things matter for a really, really long time. So they will help you if you're going to apply for foundation training, they will help you apply for AFP, they will help you when you're applying for core training. Um, my background is that in fourth year, I decided uh, kind of randomly from a conversation with my sister that I want to do Opfell. So I was like, okay, I'll just do ophthalmology. I had no clinical experience in it. Um, and ophthalmology, for example, in this country is very competitive and there's a run through process. So if you get a number after F2, you're kind of sorted until you're a consultant. And there are other run through specialties. So uh, for me, for example, getting papers in you know, med school and in first and second uh, F1, F2 genuinely will help for like the next 10 years. Genuinely, I can put in the work now, it will help me for the next five to 10 years. I would say this stuff definitely um, helps when you're applying for a registrar number two, like at later stages, and maybe even when you're a consultant, if you haven't done much more between now and then. But genuinely, these things, I think are worthy investments of your time, which is the most invaluable resource when you're a med student and even after. Uh, but essentially what I think it whittles down to for me is that getting these outcomes lets you get the job you want where you want it. That is essentially all it's about. So I want to do ophthalmology. I live in North London. I don't want to move anywhere. So I've gotten a job in ophthalmology for two years in a row, but it's not been in North London. And obviously that generally is a bit more competitive. So 
uh, this point at the bottom, which is generally I would advise that if you know, firstly, I would advise med students to try and reflect on what they want to do in life. And I think that's challenging because you have no clinical experience. So you have to do clinical rotations to kind of know what a specialty is like. But if you know what you want to do, genuinely go to the shortlisting page, find out what points exist. I know this sounds quite mercenary and quite tick boxy, but I would recommend doing it. You know what things are going to get you points when you apply for a job, do them early. And that was my approach and it, it didn't pay off. <laughs> I mean, it was helpful. I think that's an important learning point. It was very helpful because I got to F1. I literally didn't care about papers. I didn't need to run around chasing papers and be worried or prizes. I had lots and lots of stuff that I'd already got. Um, but if you can, if you know what you want to do, find the shortlisting criteria for that specific training job and just aim towards it. Now, I ha had this conversation with an, uh, a CMT, IMT mate of mine recently who wants to do a certain medical specialty and he hadn't even heard of this. I'm just like, bro, come on, man. I've been doing this since fourth year. Okay. So uh, I think it was very interesting that Stefan mentioned the, um, the point about case reports not being involved in surgical uh, like training numbers. Um, this is a, a matrix that you have to fill in when you apply for ophthalmology. And as you can see, I was, I was gassed, like the way I just cleaned up. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of these are just majorly luck. Do you know what I mean? So that, that I think reinforces my point. Because if I was Stefan, for example, I mean, I don't have, I think one of these is a case report, this one, the JAMA ophthalmology one. That is 100 words. Imagine publishing something that's 100 words, unreal, yeah? But some of these took like three years to publish. It's just headache. Um, and then some of them were a bit shorter, like a month or two. So the point I'm trying to make is you need to know what you need to get to get the job that you want where you want it. Maybe case reports won't help you, in which case that's a waste of your time, frankly, in a quite a mercenary way. Sure, you'll learn other stuff from it, but it won't help you get that outcome. Um, and one of the other things I mentioned earlier was if you don't really care what job you get and you don't really care where you get it, then this stuff kind of doesn't matter. I would just enjoy the ride and focus on aspects of medicine that you find really rewarding, which you can still do. Um, so further on from why I think it's worth putting time and effort into trying to achieve these outcomes, you are paying for them. You are paying to do a degree at a very reputable institution. There's probably going to be lots of links with research. There's going to be loads and loads of people around who actually want someone to do, to be honest, dog work. And at med school, you have, generally, you have lots and lots of time. And the most important thing is that you have no responsibility. Now, I don't mean like to your family and friends. I'm sure you have some of that. But you have no clinical responsibility. You can like just traipse in and out of the hospital at your desire, which is fantastic. And obviously, as a junior doctor, you can't really do that. Um, so I would try and make the most of the time that you're putting in at med school, because lots of it is free. And the money that you are spending being there and try and make links with people. Because if you say, I am a medical student at UCL, and you're emailing someone who's a professor at UCL, at a lab that's down the road from where you get your lectures or whatever, it becomes much easier to incorporate research into your life. So these are my publications. I just thought I'd put a list of them. Uh, and I'll talk through, these are six publications. Three of them are from my BSc. One of them uh, was from an ophthalmology project that I kind of still am involved in. One of them was a conversation in a prayer room. I'm not even lying. I want to talk about it in a sex. A bit mad. And one of them is a letter that someone I know wrote on the tube. So let's do this. These are my presentations. Again, these are, um, so you'll see, so this is a bit of a joke in the academic world, right? If you look here, the first six are all the same project but you change one word and suddenly you've got six different presentations and they were genuinely different. So for example, uh, the first one was talking about one specific aspect of the lab work that I had done in ophthalmology, working on uh, testing an asthma drug on zebrafish models of genetic eye disease and seeing if it improves the phenotype. Um, but then for example, I gave a specific lecture about that treatment approach in lots of different retinal diseases, not just the one I was working on. So you can see how your involvement in a, in a lab can, or your involvement in a project generally can kind of give lots and lots of outcomes. Um, one of these is from my BSc. So there's lots of stuff here. One's from my BSc. I think seven of these are from the ophthalmology project I've done. One of them, this one, interesting case from the surgical take. That was just a random patient when I was uh, surgical F1. These are my preclinical prizes. 
Um, basically, I won these prizes when I did my BSc, and I was very chuffed, I'm not going to lie. I'll talk about the BSc thing in a sec. I was really lucky. Um, I, I put in a lot of effort, and I worked hard, and I was very, very lucky because I picked carefully a project, carefully picked a supervisor, carefully picked a BSc, and that paid off in a major way. Um, imagine, imagine having so little from preclinical years that you have to put your A-levels and GCSEs in your achievements. Do you know what I mean? Like, that was just how I was moving, just clutching at straws. But then, pre -cl uh, clinical years onwards, then, like, you know, it started to flow a bit. I started to get into the rhythm of knowing how to apply for prizes and writing essays and, you know, applying for grants and travel grants for presenting posters and bursaries and all this kind of stuff. And these are some of the prizes that I've won since. Okay, um, so the general advice that I would give is, number one, the supervisor is absolutely imperative. I cannot stress this enough. There is no point picking a supervisor that is not really prolific and doesn't really have a track record in publication because this is a game and you need to know how to play the game and to use the words of one of my supervisors in the past it's all about spin and you just need to know how to spin the work that you've done and that is genuinely very true um, so I would try and pick someone who's outcome oriented who has a track record and that's what I did for my BSc and that paid off majorly um, these people can usually be sometimes a bit difficult to work with they can have high expectations. They expect a lot from themselves and therefore expect a lot from you. Um, they can be perceived as unpleasant. Uh, I could use worse words than that. But to be honest, it depends why you're there. If you're there to get the outcomes, you won't really care. And if you're generally a nice person, you'll do well. Um, the second piece of advice I would say is something that Stefan mentioned, which I would echo, which is try to be genuinely interested and care. Now, my position was... I don't really care about anything. Don't really care that much about any specialty. I don't go home and sit and think about, oh gosh, like let's just think about the liver. I'm not like that. I just don't care. I just wanted the outcome. I know that sounds awful, but it is what it is. Um, but when you put me in a position where I'm in a project and suddenly there is a scope for me to achieve and I know that I have to put in the work, then I really care. So my BSc was about the genetics of alcoholic liver disease. Didn't know nothing about alcoholic liver disease, didn't care about liver, didn't care about, just did not care at all. To be fair, I was a preclinical student when I took it on. But at the stage in which I was doing the BSc, I really cared a lot. But generally try and show that you're someone that's passionate and interested and motivated. I've already mentioned this, trying to utilize the, the institution you're in. And we talked about cold, like cold calls, cold emails, just randomly emailing people. I would say that I had heard of, um, Certain students at certain medical schools, no comments, yeah? No names, we'll just throw some sly shade, yeah? Certain students at certain medical schools that used to go on there somewhere and be like, right, email list, top 10 profs. Sounds like Stefan did that a bit, yeah? But um, I didn't know many people that did that. <laughs> and um, you know what, it pays off. Stefan is an example of that paying off. I've done cold emails before and it really paid off. So you have to be a bit brave. That's what I'm saying. The truth is this can be a bit embarrassing. And you're just like a bit of a no one saying, oh, like, take me on, look after me, take me under your wing. And actually that can pay off in a very, very good way. Uh, and the final piece of advice I would say is you better be lucky because you need to be really lucky to get this stuff. Like if you think about all the hurdles and barriers that are going to pr confront you, trying to just get a PubMed ID, it's a bit mad. So you need to be someone that is very lucky. I think the point I'm trying to make is, unfortunately, you can't control everything in life. You, all you can do is show that you're really passionate, show you're keen, put in lots of effort when it counts and just like hope that it all goes well. Because genuinely the process of like doing the work, being lucky enough to meet the right people and then being lucky enough to be allowed to do the specific work that will get you authorship, and then being lucky enough for your someone or you to write the paper and then being lucky enough for someone else to take it over and actually make it good because you've probably written rubbish because you're a med student and then being lucky enough that that, you know, the edits that the uh, you know the editorial team suggests are like acceptable, being lucky enough that it gets published. There's just lots of luck needed, and I will talk about luck shortly. I don't know if I'm running over a bit. Uh, I'm gonna try and hurry up. Am I good? I'm all right. I'm gonna try and maybe like another five minutes. If that's yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna try. And... It's not all luck, Adam. It's persistence. <laughs> we'll talk about this in the q a guys <laughs> this is very controversial we'll talk about it we'll talk about it so yeah I, I mean i agree i agree i i certainly am someone that was persistent over many years and i i i guess it it depends how you view your activity and involvement i 
definitely i mean i was absolutely persistent i was quite mercenary with some people i was just like yeah listen i uh, i want a paper so um do you think we could get that <laughs> i had conversations like that but i i mean luck for me is a very significant factor so what i'm going to do briefly is just talk to you about the few stints that i've had in research um and tell you what i got out of them and how they went and then hopefully i'll wrap up hopefully i won't take longer than five minutes so my bsc was in uh third year I did it in clinical sciences, which is kind of infamous. Basically, the, the supervisor that runs this BSc is very well known for being outcome oriented and achieving those outcomes quite impressively. So I had a mate in the year of a few years above me who told me that he did this BSc and got X, Y, Z prize and presentation and posters. And I remember hearing about it as a first or second year and thinking, this is exactly what I need in my BSc, exactly what I need. Um, and I basically did the BSc. I showed I was, I think, nice, pleasant, showed that I was very keen and passionate. I was very clear that I want to achieve. I actually had a stepwise progression of what I wanted to achieve from the year. I was like, I minimum want to get a first. And basically, this BSc at the time had a 70% rate of first. So it was just unreal, right? I was like, minimum I want to get as a first. Then, if I'm lucky, I want to get some posters and prizes. Then, if I'm lucky, I want to get a paper. And then, if I'm even luckier, PhD. So I was on a bit of a mad one. And I went as I got a PhD interview and the rest of the stuff I got and then didn't get the PhD, which definitely was a very good thing for me. But that's fine. Um, so yeah, I supervisor was very driven. I then picked we had a selection of projects clinical versus basic science. I picked basic science, thinking that it would be harder to publish than clinical, which is correct. But I picked it because the supervisor of the BSc was supervising that project. And that was the best move ever. So that's really all I have to say. And yeah, I got three papers out of that. And this is another thing, the original article. So it's not like a letter to someone. It's like a proper scientific paper in basic science. So I'm actually quite happy and proud of them, to be honest. I'm very lucky that I got them. There was a lot of work done by a lot of people that without them, I wouldn't have achieved the outcome. Um, I presented one poster in Denmark and won a travel bursary that paid for like most of the trip. Uh, and I won a prize for a thousand pounds. It was just, you know, like she was just like, oh, like you should apply for this prize. I, I, I get someone this prize every year. And I was like, oh, go on then. Um, and then she rewrote a lot of it and uh, it, it got the prize. <laughs> so very lucky. Okay, then I got a nature paper. So, uh, so yeah, the, the topic, yes, bow to me. Yeah, actually, yes and don't bow to me because yours is better than mine. Basically, um, we picked this title uh, in a slightly um, tongue-in-cheek way because all the papers that we have in NAJ and Melanza and Nature are a bit of a joke. But I'm going to tell you the story anyway, right? Basically, when I was a kid, I was involved in um, presenting on a religious channel, right, for some mates. And at the time, I was like, well, I mean, I was, okay, I'll just explain it fully. It's a bit weird story. I was very religious, much more religious when I was younger. And I was like kind of involved in this community. And they were like, oh, like, come present for us, do a talk show, do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, go on then. But really, I was just helping out my mate because they needed filler for their um, channel. Um, I remember doing it and just being like, oh, like, this is just a bit of a waste of time. But I was like, yeah, I'm, I was chilling with my friends. It was fine. Then in fifth year, and at this point, I was like, someone get me a paper. I need a paper right now. And I was so scared. I had finished my BSc and nothing had come out of it yet. Um, and I was very desperately looking for a publication, any project that I could get onto, like Stefan mentioned, one of these like easy ones, you could just kind of jump on and do a bit of work. And I was praying in a prayer room after like a day of like clinical, right? And this guy like is standing while I'm praying, just looking at me. Now, generally I would have to say that's not a good sign. <laughs> if you're praying and someone's standing watching you kind of waiting for you to finish, this might be a bit of a punch up, do you know what I mean? It's like, you don't know where this is going, right? Anyway, so I finished praying and he's like, oh, aren't you Muhammad Adam Ali? I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I've seen you on this channel. Like, I've seen you, like, hi. I'm like, you know, we're like, same religion. Hi, how are you? And then we got to chatting. So I remember this conversation went off and I was proper like CBA. I was just like, oh, I just finished a long day. Just want to go home, just allow it, man. But I was nice. I was like, let me be nice. Let me show some interest, right? So I'm like, oh, like, so, you know, tell me about yourself, which I think is being nice, right? And he's like, oh, I'm doing a PhD upstairs. And I was like, all right, cool. I was like, well, you know, I'm trying to get a paper actually, lol. So uh, can you bring me in? Like, do you have any papers that are easy peasy, lemon squeezy, could dash me on it, do a bit of work? And he was like, 
yeah, actually, um, I'm working with this brother and we're publishing in Nature a lot. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, yeah, so, um, so Nature, you know Nature? I was like, are you asking me if I know Nature? And I was like, look, are you saying Nature the journal or Nature one of the 20 offshoots with a much lower impact factor? And he went, no, 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 Nature. Now, some of you may know that these big journals like The Lancet and Nature have offshoot journals, which are specialty journals. The impact factor is much less, okay? So he showed me, and basically it was this Nature drug, I think it's drug reviews. And the impact factor, so it was an offshoot, it wasn't Nature, but the impact factor was higher than Nature. So in Nature is like 43, which is very, very high. The impact factor for this journal was like 57. So I was like, let's swap numbers, let's swap details. And then basically in fifth year, I did a project with him and his mate. And it was on um, like a pharma sort of thing on antihypertensives. And uh, just give me one sec, my dad's walked in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, he got me a snap. Just bear with me, yeah? Sorry. Um, so I'm like, I'm like Tim, okay, like, bring me in. Like, I'll do a paper, right? We basically did a, a little essay on antihypertensives and the pharma landscape of antihypertensives. Um, and then the senior author kind of knew the people at Nature. He had a relationship with them. He'd written a lot of stuff for them. And it got in. And I don't know nothing about antihypertensives. I, I really spent a lot of time trying to understand the landscape and putting in the effort and trying to get, you know, the lingo as correct as possible, reviewing all the past literature. It was long, took a lot of effort, but I knew that there was this kind of high impact possible publication at the end. And I, I got a little review in Nature. It's like two, three pages um, in a Nature offshoot that's got a very high impact factor. So I think the moral of that story is, I mean, you could call it luck. If you're religious, you might call it something else, but I think that's very lucky. Very, very lucky. And I'm very happy and grateful and then the last project sorry i've overrun a bit i thought that story is worth telling it's like my one of my favorite stories about publishing um the last project that i did i've been involved with uh, a lab uh, at moorfields and the institute of ophthalmology doing genetic eye disease so projects on zebrafish um and that has been very very good so the way that one worked was i cold emailed the head of medical education for ophthalmology when i was a ucl med student and i said i'm a ucl med student I'm here anyway, I kind of want to be involved in research, can you help? And she was not very helpful, because I kind of wanted her to say, oh, I've got five projects, just come, like, let's meet. So what she suggested was going to uh, essentially a research seminar that they run at Moorfields, which actually I think still exists, called Moorfields Academy. I went, one of the lecturers there, so they have like a day of lectures, one of the lecturers was my future supervisor, she was talking about genetic eye disease, and I just went up to her after the lecture, and I was like, that was a, I really enjoyed your lecture, I um, you know, want to do ophthalmology in the future. I've just done a project on genetics of liver disease. This is genetics of eye disease. So, you know, maybe you could bring me in. And she was very, very, very nice and kind. And she was very receptive. She, um, I don't know how common this is. She was very nice. Like she took me under her wing. Uh, we swapped email addresses. I emailed her expecting her to just ignore me because that happens a lot. She replied pretty quick and said, yeah, let's meet up. We met up within a week. She gave me, um, like Stefan had, a project that was done already, but like written up, but I had to like do it, which did not go anywhere. Um, and then I, I said to her, well, look, I'm a UCL med student. I'm in my fifth year. I kind of don't care about deciles this year. Um, do you think I could just do some lab work, like maybe an hour or two a week, you know, half a day a week um, and see where it goes? And she was like, she was like even more determined than me. She was like, yeah, we'll get you a lab project. You can come in. You can get a little paper, you can get a poster, you can present it, and then do ophthalmology. So she was very lovely. Um, and that relationship has resulted in a lot. So it's been five years now. Um, I've had three prizes. One of them was big. Like one of them was at a, was at a national conference, like best paper prize. This was all through her, really. Um, I've presented the work seven times. One of them was an oral presentation that I did as a final year at the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, like annual congress. So it was like Hi, I'm a med student presenting some work. And then a consultant came on and then a reg came on. So it was, it was very nice. It was really good. Um, and then uh, when I was in F1, she was like, oh, like, we've got a case. Can you just write it? And it was 100 words. And I wrote it and it got published. Just exactly what you want. And a paper that's kind of pending is basic science. So I'm really struggling to push that through because I'm not a basic scientist. I don't have the time or effort to go to a lab every day. And now with COVID, it's all up in the air. And then I've got a med ed paper. A mate was like, oh, listen, I want to write a med ed paper in COVID. Uh, I just wrote something on the tube. Do you want to be on it? And then I took it and revised it and made some suggestions and then we submitted it and it was in. 
Um, there's a, so that's the end of my stories. I've got more stories about failures, which I think Yezin is going to talk about later. So I won't talk about that now. Uh, I actually think I've had an abnormally high success to attempt ratio, if that makes sense. The number of attempts I've made, quite a lot of them have been successful and most med students are not. And that's what I think is the luck bit. Uh, just gonna whiz through this last bit, sorry. Um, basically, I think all publications look good on paper, as long as there's a PubMed ID. Unofficially, this is my opinion. I think impact factor really, 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 really matters. I really think it matters to me because I think that quality is more important than quantity of papers. Um, but again, it's not the be all end all. If you tell a scientist about impact factor, they'll get very angry. Um, and in descending order, these are kind of the most impressive and by proxy time consuming efforts that you can do. You can do an original article, which is long, it's like a proper RCT or study. You can do a systematic review, which is really long, reviewing all the literature. You can do a case series, which is kind of long, which has lots of case reports. You can do a case report, which is decent. It's basically an essay on a patient. Um, and then by extension, you can do a photo quiz, which is the thing that I love the most out of everything, which is a photo and 100 or 200 words and you're in, and it's on PubMed, which I think is the best. And you can do a letter, which is a very short um, uh, like essay, but it has to be of interest. And this stuff has to be high quality to get published. Um, okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is, for me, getting outcomes is all about getting a job. Basically, get the job you want where you want. I know lots of people that scored very highly on exceptionally competitive jobs, like cardiothoracics, ophthalmology, because these are the kinds of people that I mix with to kind of know what I need to do who had no papers, no papers, third in the country, no papers, first in the country. It really is not the be all and end all. Interviews matter, which is kind of why I didn't get a job, even though I had lots of stuff, because my interview scores were not very good. Um, and I was just going to say, I think interviews are a bit subjective, but you have to take that with a grain of salt, because obviously someone that flopped an interview would say that, right? Um, but I read this really, really nice article that my supervisor sent me after I basically flopped one station on the ophthalmology interview, which was comm skills, which actually is I think by far and away my strength and basically if you I think this is a nice article to read if you want to you know help yourself get to sleep at night and be comfortable with the fact that you don't get the job you want even though you start in fourth year which is me um but uh essentially interviews are very subjective uh, I, I'd advise you read it in your spare time interviews are very subjective and that is a very significant proportion of deciding whether or not you get a job so the moral of the story is putting in effort to get outcomes I think is worthwhile it will help for a very long time but it ain't the be all and end all. And I'm gonna stop there. Sorry for running over, I apologize, Yazid. That's all right, thanks very much, Adam, that's great. Um, so some feedback for you in the Q&A. You guys are an inspiration, so well done to you both. Uh, and I love how pure and honest Ali is. Uh, can we have him back for more talks? So it'd be great if you can come back. Uh, yeah, I'd love to, I'd be happy to. And uh, with you giving me a bit of an introduction about my failures, which is good, a good way to start. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, but uh, I think, we will, I'll just, yeah, let me just go on to my talk and then we will take some questions. Uh, Stefan, are you okay to hang out for a bit or are you going to head off? Or? All good. Yeah, keep going. This is great. Cool. Uh, so let's... This is on my mobile, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll still be around. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so let's go there. Oh, sorry. Wait, let me stop share there. Got the wrong one. Uh, so that is the wrong presentation, and then, yeah, that's the one, fine. Sorry guys, but, uh, it is, yeah, that's the one. Okay, cool. So last topic for me, so uh, Adam, if you're around, if, if you can answer people's questions, I think they've been asking you stuff. Uh, so have a look and see. Um, so thanks very much. So uh, the last talk for today. Uh, so my name is Yezen. I am a internal medicine trainee in South London at the moment. So this year I'm at St. George's. Next year I'm at Guy's. Um, I qualified from UCL Medical School 2016. And I am very interested in neurology. And I did neuroscience as my BSc. Um, and then after, right after we finished medical school as a final year, we finished started F1, Stefan and I founded questmed.com, which has been sort of my extension of my interest in academic sides of medical education, which I'll talk about. I think some people had questions earlier, so I'll talk a bit more about MedEd. Um, I then ended up doing North Central London Foundation Programme, 
at Lister and Stevenage and the Royal Free. And then I did an F3, what Adam's doing this year uh, as a clinical research fellow at UCLH and Queen Square. So uh, very sort of neurological later on, but more sort of med ed to start off with, but a bit of neuroscience as well. So I'll tell you a bit more about my journey and what I learned, as I'm sure it will be useful to those who perhaps may not actually publish anything at all during medical school, which was the case for me. So I think the reason I, I'm probably my side of the story is useful is because I'm a bit of a slow burner. I st started off later on. So I think I set up some foundations in final year with academics and really built things. But by the time I actually got the outcomes, probably around F1, F2, and then that did really well for me when I applied for my internal medicine training. So it's not the end of the world if you don't get published during medical school. There is loads of time to do it later on. So I think that's the, the key take home message from my own story, at least. Um, I made this because I wanted to really illustrate the type of students they were uh, in regards to how people are maybe about third or fourth year when you first start in clinics. And uh, these are people that, or the sort of characteristics that I found possibly in others, but also in myself. So uh, the, there's the bookworm who likes science generally, and those are the sort of people that really, really like everything scientific and will read papers and will really get into it. And those are the sort of people that perhaps they may tend to do an MD PhD, for example. Um, and then they just have this pure love for science, which is great. And I think a lot of us do have a bit, but maybe not as much as others. Um, some people will have a lot. And there are some people who are all about the points. So the Pac-Man, they are all about the specialty applications. They will have the specialty applications on their wall from day one, trying to figure out <laughs> how they can get those specialty applications. And I, I, I perhaps wasn't that much when I first started in clinical years, but then later on, I began to realize that you need to get outcomes, as Adam was saying, and these outcomes are dictated by how you, much you plan early on. Some people are less intense. They are what I call the estate agent. This was also myself. So you just want to live somewhere competitive, i.e. in London. So those people will say, and I, and I have said this, oh, you know, I don't care about all this stuff. I just want to stay in London. Which, or, you know, or I want to stay somewhere else that is competitive. And then that's fair. You know, you want to get points. You want to make sure that, you know, if you have family here or whatever, um, or if you, you really want to stay just because, you know, all your friends are here, that's fair. And, and that people just want to get more points and therefore they get jobs. And I think it's sort of an extension in a way of the specialty application person and finally the opportunist who sort of seems to be very lucky and does a bsc and does really well and then ends up having eight papers from that bsc um, and some people are lucky and, and that happens but uh, again what stefan was saying about this sort of persistence so is it luck or is it persistence is it both i think i would argue that there's a mix of both definitely luck and persistence together will like, put you in a good uh, position going forward um, so BSc is very difficult because you, it's, and some universities as part of your curriculum and others you have to apply for it. Um, it's difficult to find the right supervisor to see whether or not they have enough time for you or if the thing that they want you to do is what you want to do. I ended up doing mine in cognitive neuroscience at Queen's Square, um, a, a part of UCL. It was really niche and it was some really specialist stuff. And actually looking back, I didn't really understand it very much, but I sort of figured out how to, uh, over time, to really understand the underlying neuroscience. Possibly could have been better if I did something clinical. Uh, maybe I could have published it, I didn't. Uh, and, but I really enjoyed it. I just really liked neuroscience at the time and it was really cool. And I was in a center where everyone else liked neuroscience. I could talk about neuroscience without people saying I was a massive nerd. And so, you know, it, it worked out well. And I did really well actually in that year. And because I enjoyed it, I think I really pushed myself and ended up getting a first class BSc, which going forward weirdly is really well really well received in lots of different applications so i found out in medical training if you get first class um, you end up getting more points and even when i was applying for an f3 like one of my supervisors was like oh yeah you got a first class bsc in neuroscience oh fine fine like it's you obviously know what you're doing which it's difficult to say but it just shows that you are academically capable i think um, and it's just something that you can gain out of it without actually publishing so I didn't get published in my BSc, but I learned so much and I, I made so many contacts and it was really, really useful. And I definitely nerded out for one full year in neuroscience, which was something I really enjoyed myself. Others might not. Um, so in terms of my own publishing journey, I started off with medical education. I didn't have a supervisor and, and I'm going to talk about this. I think some people mentioned it in the chat earlier on. Um, 
And basically, I started off with a letter to the editor. So we were doing lots of peer-assisted learning. So we, we started, a, some, some of you who have gone to UCL, the PAC scheme, uh, which is still going on, which is really good. I'm very pleased about it. But basically, we started a, a scheme on teaching medical students, preclinical medical students, um, and uh, doing it in the form of single best answer questions. And then, so the, the topic of the letter to the editor was how to support the new near peer tutor. How do we develop them? Which was sort of a, a hot topic, peer assisted learning, but like trying to get a different angle from it. Uh, it didn't take long to write, and it does, letters to the editor count for F pass points. So it's something, if you have an interest in something, you can definitely consider it or consider. Uh, consider writing something short about it. We didn't have a supervisor, uh, we just sort of did it ourselves. Um, I'll talk about the relevance of that going forward. Um, so then after that, we sort of thought, okay, let's get a paper out. And me and a couple of friends, all of these people in this author list are not doctors, were not doctors at the time. They're doctors now, obviously. But uh, at the time, we didn't have a supervisor. And it generally came out of this idea that we had a genuine interest in medical education. We just really liked it. It was always cool. Initially, it got rejected because it was just qualitative and um, because it all it was like people saying, telling us, oh, we like this part, we like that part. But actually, we didn't have any quantitative data. And that was stuff like pre and post tutorial quizzes. So we eventually we added that on and it got accepted, which we were very, very pleased about. This was the first sort of big paper, not big paper, but sort of first original research article that we did. And actually it ended up being the springboard for developing our website, questmed.com, because we were frustrated by what's going on um, in terms of preclinical and clinical resources. And we essentially take, took it into our own hands to develop a resource for them. And that's when me and Stefan sort of tried to develop this. And over the past few years, we've been you know, very pleased with the reception to it so far. Um, and finally, we developed, uh, so towards the end of medical school, an editorial, about 12 tips on setting up and running a peer-led medical education society. Um, and yeah, it didn't take long. It was topical. People liked it. Um, people made use of it. Um, but really, all three previous papers had no supervisor, which actually, looking back, was a really maverick decision. Like, how would a couple of medical students just decide to put out these papers? I think the fact that we had good skills, writing skills already, that we had developed through, lots of us had done BSCs, we had a good understanding of the literature and how to analyze the literature. And we actually, in ourselves, did a couple of years of peer-assisted learning. So we had enough to write about something decent. But if I went back, I probably would have tried to find a supervisor. And I think this is really, really not applicable to most other specialties, most other um, uh, areas of interest, because you really do need a supervisor. And, and I'll tell you why you need a supervisor in my next slide. So the supervisor is really useful because a lot of what you're going to be doing is collecting data, analyzing data, writing up to a certain extent, and understanding how the literature works. But the supervisor will look at your writing, will pick up the gaps in your knowledge, will tell you that there are these articles you need to consider. Um, they'll have a similar background to your peer reviewers, so they'll understand the, the lay of the land, as it were. And they'll give you moral support if things go wrong, um, which sometimes, you know, if you get rejected, you know, you may think, oh, this is the end of my academic career. Uh, but actually, they will support you and say, no, it's fine. We'll just get another one. Um, and they will put their name by it, which is important, I think, because then you sort of, they have that responsibility and therefore they will want to make sure that everything is fine. The only thing, the, the big thing I would mention about supervisors, you need to balance between having a big name, so like a really sort of well-established professor who may not have enough time for you, or sort of a, a, an upstart as well, who's sort of just starting out, just trying to understand things because may, they may not be as, you know, they may not be as experienced. So it's difficult. You'll, you won't really know until you've actually worked with them. But as a medical student, I think something that you have is time uh, to a certain extent. So you have enough time to make those mistakes. I made lots of mistakes. So I think look at people's PubMed IDs, look at the research that they've done, look at the, the people that have collaborated with. That'll give you a better idea roughly on whether or not they're going to be able to support you. Um, subsequently, at the end of medical school and foundation years, I sort of had this bit of a panic, I suppose. Um, I think I was about 50 a medical student. I want to do something academic. I want to do neurology. I have no publications. Oh, I'm going to freak out, you know? And I think, uh, I don't know what it's like in other universities, but certainly at UCL, I think definitely there was this idea that, oh, we need to publish, or otherwise we will not succeed. Um, I think Adam probably, I think Adam's nodding his head here, but yeah, definitely there is that sort of freak out. And then one guy has eight publications and you're like, how did you get eight publications? And then it's just sort of, 
you know, whispering and people talking. It's like, oh, okay, there are people, there is panic. Um, I think in certain institutions, certainly in ours, but definitely looking back, I shouldn't have panicked so much. But anyways, I was sort of thinking about it. It was on my mind. And then in the fifth year Oski waiting room, uh, as we were preparing for my exams, uh, a friend of mine was there. We're not really that good friends, uh, but we were always friendly. We sort of saw each other from time to time and said hello. And then she just said to me, oh, by the way, you like neurology, right? Like my supervisor is looking for someone to ha help out with another project. Uh, and that escalated and, you know, I ended up getting a publication out of it, which I'm very proud of. I'll talk about it in a second. And then subsequently working, just submitted another one. So that's sort of two good, reasonable quality publications just because I knew someone who had a supervisor. So I think along the lines of networking and, and true for most of medicine is try not to make any enemies. Try to just be friends with every, everyone as much as you can. Be nice. And that will send, send you a long way, I think, uh, going forward. Um, so this was the paper um, that my friend told me about. Um, it was so much work. It was mega data collection. I, I, it was 100 patients over 20 years. And I would sit there weekends just collecting data, analyzing the data. And it actually took a few years. So I think it was published January 19. I think I started working on it in maybe... February 2016 or something like that. So it was, took ages, but I learned a lot. I learned about data collection. I learned SPSS, which is a way of collect, um, collecting and analyzing statistical data. I did a few presentations in Liverpool and Paris and Northern Italy, which was really nice. Um, and then submitted a second publication. So I got a lot out of it just because I happened to be friend, you know, friendly, not even a friend, friendly with someone who you know, needed some help. So I think that's good to keep your eyes open. And then after F2 is really when things started to heat up, I think for me on an academic side, which is, which is what I want to try and tell you that you don't need to publish everything when you are, you know, minus first year of medical school, you know, when you're just on your UCAT, you know, it's, it's fine to get things like going later on, which is the case for me. Um, what Adam is doing, this F3, what people talk about after your F2, lots of people do use it to bolster your academic um, credentials, you make connections, you have some time to publish, um, but you need to push for it. You need to really work for it. You need to get connections. You need to say, I want to do research. Um, let's please, um, please allow me to do some research. Um, but I think you will make more money locoming full time, probably, and Adam probably will agree with this. And um, so you need to sort of, figure out whether or not you're able to lose out financially and think about the long term rather than just locum full time and you will make a lot of money out of it so the short game versus the long game is very important um and then this just comes into this point about this is a controversial sort of topic in the sense that you know can students and junior doctors from lower income groups or older students can they afford to take time out to publish I mean, loads of people, loads of my colleagues, you know, will have part, some people have part-time jobs doing medical school, families, traveling, you know, this year out that you could take getting loads of money off as a locum, you could have just done it, uh, done research. So really the question is, could you, you know, is, is it fair? That's a question that some, you know, some people ask. And, and I think that's a very valid question. Like, is there a bias towards people who are more likely able to take time out? The other question is, can junior doctors and students who are at universities that are not very research orientated, can they have the same opportunities? I guess there's an argument for the idea that if you work in a very academic institution, you can um, find loads of people who are interested in you, but also there are people who are really competitive who, and, and load their lots, opportunities. Loads of people will send cold emails. Loads of people will try and get onto opportunities. Perhaps if you're in a smaller hospital or a smaller institution, maybe not many people are so interested, so you can sort of get in a bit more uh, into the platform, uh, sorry, into the, uh, into the program because just there's not that much interest. And there will be certain hospitals that are seemingly not very academic, but they have very established departments. So for example, when I was in Stevenage and Lister in my F1, I realized that the urology department there, urology, UR, was really established and they had loads of stuff going on doing research. And, in, and Stevenage is not really well known to be an academic institution in, in Lister, uh, sorry, Lister and Stevenage. So that's something to take into consideration if you work in a, or you are in a university that is thought to be or perceived to be less academically inclined client. So that's just a point that I've sort of figured out over the past couple of years thinking I do reflect on it from time to time. Um, so basically I started this F3 and um, I started my F3 in the um, 
in Queen Square and UCLH, and I did it in stroke and neurology. And, and I was very happy that I actually got involved in this program of the, this um, research department that did this really rare disease called superficial sclerosis. And it sort of fits in, it didn't exactly fit in with my plan, I suppose, because it was such a rare disease, but it did, we did actually do it in neurology. So it did fit. But it, I had to actually work quite hard to get involved in the academic group because, you know, I had lots of clinical commitments as well. So what I did over a few months was just really get to know everyone, did a lot of things, ran a teaching program for all the other doctors, helped out with running this MDT for superficial cirrhosis with my supervisor. And I just genuinely learned a lot about clear academic writing and how to sort of go about it. Um, and to me, sort of, um, this was really one of my you know, one of my best articles, I suppose, in a way, because it was something that I genuinely worked really hard on. And it was because I worked uh, with a big department, an academic department, and I took time out, I was able to do so. Um, so perhaps if I didn't, wasn't able to take that time out, maybe I wouldn't have been able to. So this is uh, the, the publication that is Adam's favorite. So uh, this is a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, which um, Adam really likes the New England Journal of Medicine and has spent hours talking to me about it. Um, so basically this is a letter to the editor and there was a review article that uh, about superficial sclerosis, the rare disease we talked about, um, and um, we, we noticed that they didn't meant, so sorry, it was about a, um, a medication called the Ferropro. And, they, and no one mentioned uh, superficial sclerosis. So essentially, this letter to the editor is saying, I appreciate your article. It was a very good article. But also, you should remember that this drug can be used for superficial sclerosis. And that was kind of it. And it was run by my, and it was developed by my supervisor. Um, and that's me right at the end. And obviously, it's a very high impact factor in New England Journal of Medicine. Like, OK, that's great. But actually, my role sort of was, it was a very short article. It wasn't something that, um, I had too much of a role in the sense that I helped writing some stuff. It was a very short article. So the question really, uh, which Adam and I have been discussing a lot over the past couple of weeks, is like, is this my best work? You know, is this, is this high level of English journal medicine? As Adam agrees, I disagree. But I think more it's about being involved in an academic center with loads of very active researchers. And because I did so much, I was around and people remembered me and people were like, oh, yes, and you know, you did stuff for superficial cirrhosis. Do you want to help out with this? And I was like, yeah, okay, fine. So being involved, making those connections, taking time out, all of these sort of came together and honed into this New England Journal of Medicine. Wow, let's the editor. But actually, if you were to ask me, Adam will disagree. Um, that I'm probably prouder of the one that I worked on in a lot more detail because I learned more about it and probably I will be able to talk about it more in interviews where things are very sort of holistic. So th those are my thoughts initially about uh, this particular topic. Adam's laughing, he disagrees, but yeah, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, as I was doing my clinical research fellow year, I also worked on a, a costing study in mechanical thrombectomy. Again, a multi-center, large study, um, a bit of a quality improvement project because we're talking about costs and things, but it also adds to the literature. Sometimes it can be a bit gray area. And it allowed me to understand how to liaise with different researchers and understand that it's not just about being in London. You know, it's, there's lots of other stuff across the UK, which sometimes we forget when we live in London. So, um, but they actually spelled my name wrong, Yazin Samurai, so you can see here, which is completely inappropriate. But actually, if you go on PubMed, if you type in Y Samurai, it does come up, which was fine. But I was very upset in the first, uh, <laughs> the first week or so, but it was fine, it was fine. Um, this is one other thing I worked on a thrombectomy. It didn't get published, uh, but I went to Milan. I went and it was good, went to a big international conference. So it's fine to not get published sometimes and you just learn some stuff and you go to conferences and you hang out with people and you make some more connections. Um, my failures, um, as we were alluding to earlier, uh, we spent nine months trying to publish a systematic review in bariatric surgery. Um, this was, I was kind of connected to them by the, our like, local like, publishing um, or research group at UCL is called Academics, Academics, sorry, some people may have come across them. My supervisor had no publishing experience at all. I, I realized afterwards that he had not published much at all in bariatric surgery. And when I actually looked at the um, systematic review, what he wanted to do, there was no real need for it. Like it was already done before. So I just spent nine months essentially not really knowing what to do. 
um, and then just sort of fizzled out. Um, another option, another thing that happened was that a lecturer asked me to write about a drug that wasn't being costed and something related to NICE guidelines. Did loads of research and found out that they just didn't look into it properly. They didn't read the evidence. And actually, when I emailed them loads of times saying, uh, I'm not sure this is going to be good, they just didn't reply. And that was a bit of a wasted kind of two months in my life. So, you know, as I said, with all the successes, there are failures as well. So you, you learn from all of them, I think, and you learn how to choose the right supervisor, which is very important. Um, so, yeah, that's my talk. Um, finding the right supervisor, doing your research on them and what they've done, checking if it's worth the effort, developing foundations in medical school if you are not keen to start so early, learn how to write and familiarize yourself with specialty applications, uh, keep in touch with your supervisor, and push for trying to complete stuff as much as you can. And uh, make use of uh, making this, making posters and traveling whenever possible when we will be allowed to do so in the nearer future. Um, we're gonna do a few more talks, so making posters, academic writing, quality improvement projects, and depending on how many people we can get, have to get into medicine, surgery, radiology, ophthal, and essentially anyone else we can find to give talks. So uh, do follow us on our Facebook page um, so that uh, we can find out what's going on. So I think that's me. Thank you very much. Um, so Adam, let's go through some questions, I think, uh, if you're happy. Um, so I'm going to... I'm also here if you want to have, have oh, questions to me as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, fine. So I'm going to stop the screen share, actually, just so that we can see. So I think the um, I will let me just get there's a couple of questions I wanted to answer because it's important because some people have put it in before. I want to the first question I want to ask because loads of people have asked it is how do you do this in lockdown? How do we how are we how are people going to do research in lockdown? Uh, Adam, I don't know what you think based on what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, that's hard. Um, really hard because a lot of it is based on, uh, you know, for generating relationships with people. And obviously the whole way the world runs socially has just been turned on its head. So I think it's going to be very difficult. And um, even the research teams I'm involved with, all the work has just changed completely. So I think that is going to be a real challenge. This sort of opportunity of getting together with people like as a you know happening, oh hey, I ran into you, you know, that's and I ran into them and then a couple of years later I got a publication, like that sort of stuff that won't happen as much, I think. But I think people academics are still doing stuff and will be interested in involving students, but maybe waiting till how things pan out in the next couple of months, we'll have a clearer view of what, what things are. Uh, I would also say when I was a med student, I always tried to push for stuff that I could do remotely. If I could ever just do stuff remotely at home, that was ideal. If I could just ch -ch 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 my laptop. Absolutely. And there are some supervisors who are able to hook it up for you. Um, so it's definitely worth still speaking to people on rotations and consultants and registrars and asking if you can get involved. I mean, I used to have to go into UCLH and, and sneak into UCLH and uh, find a computer to get all the stuff on a Sunday night. But now all of it is online, so you can actually access things remotely. So hopefully that will, that will help. Um, the other thing is, um, do you need publications to do F1 in a London hospital? Uh, no, you don't need to. And John, uh, to oh, okay. So I would say I know lots and lots of people who didn't have papers that got into very competitive hospitals. Like I was at the free, Royal Free for F1, mm. big teaching hospital, you know, Hampstead, nice place. Lots of people want to go there. There were lots of people that didn't have papers. Loads, mm. not even loads of F1s, and F2s, regs. You know, specialty trainees, lots. So you don't need to worry about that at all. If memory serves me correctly, the way that you get in uh, to foundation training is like deciles plus SJT. Uh, and then you get a mark out of 50 that gets doubled. If you do, yeah. you can smash your SJT and even be quite mediocre at deciles and get a really, really high score. Or vice versa, you can uh, smash the deciles and flop or do okay at the SJT and still get a really high score. So papers are like two marks out of 50. Unless yeah. my memory serves me incorrectly. So, so it's really not a big deal. So I think we should, I'd like to do this. Are you, you're free to join, Adam, if you want, is to do a talk about, like, do death house really matter? And we can talk about the sort of ins and outs. But we'll do that at a later date, I think. Um, do you have anything to add, Stefan, on, on your, your side? Well, I completely agree. If, if, if you're not looking at AFDs, academic foundation program, uh, for, forcing yourself to do papers or pushing to get publications is not going to be a good use of your time. 
you're going to get much more out of your application by focusing on your clinical studies, getting your the right death files, focusing on your SJT and getting a good score out of that. Because just like Adam said, you're going to get 50 points on your SJT, publication is only going to give you two. If you're looking for an academic foundation program, getting one or two publications is more than enough for you to go anywhere in the country. And it's just about how you interview after that point. Looking further down the line, looking down at like the um, academic clinical fellowships afterwards, looking for PhD projects, that's when the papers are really going to matter. Um, um, and even then, you can get those positions or get those jobs even with zero publications. It's just going to be much more difficult. Um, cool. Thanks, Stefan. So that's I just great. Want to add, if you don't mind, just one thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I've not really addressed at all doing an AFP. Mm. Uh, and that's because I didn't do one. And that's because I applied, but I filled out the application wrong. So I don't know if I would have got one or not. Mm. I've completely given all this advice, forgetting that's really an option. So I apologize to some of you who might be interested in the academic foundation program. I would say if you're going down the academic route, these things matter. They really, really matter. Like if you're going to try and be an academic, you need to be trying to demonstrate that you have ability and skill in academia. And that is getting outcomes. But having said that, I know people who got into AFP in London with no papers. So, so I don't know if, if you wanted to say anything about that, seeing as you did the AFP as well. So I, I, I think that it's very, very important how you do your interview. Having publications is going to make a huge difference when you sit in front of an interview panel and you're already in their positive mindset by saying, listen, I published, you know, 10 publications or I published five publications or two. And they're already thinking, okay, this is interesting. What did you do? Tell me more about it. It's going to be much easier for them to question you and see how good you are and how dedicated you are to, to academia if you have those publications. Even if you, if you don't have them, you can still show yourself as a very good and strong candidate, but it just you means you're starting off in the back foot. Um, but I have friends that have gotten uh, AFPs and ACS with no publications, but they usually have something else in the portfolio that really shows them, makes them stand out. I've, you know, prepared myself for this ACF. I've gotten a grant application. I've done my ethics. I know what project I want to do. This is exactly what I'm prepared for for the last year during my foundation year. And this is what I want to do. And this is how I want to do it. This is the supervisors I know. Those are the kind of things you need to show in your interviews that's going to make you stand out and make you actually a good candidate. So uh, in, in light of the persistence, so someone has said, do you have any projects that you would like medical students to help in? So that's the sort of spirit that's the sort of gunning uh, that is uh, is reasonable to um, to find people, and that's fine. You know, all uh, when I was a student, I used to you know go to medical trainees or registrars or consultants, and be like, "Do you have any projects? Do you have any projects?" And you know, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I'm afraid I don't. I don't think the other guys do, uh, but uh, certainly something that um, you can ask people. So that's fine. Um, would having an intercalated degree be an essential to get into London hospitals? Um, no, I don't think absolutely so. Absolutely not. No, no, I don't think so. It's, it's useful because it gives you a few points, certainly, but it's not necessary, no. I would say I know someone that has not done a BSc and struggled for a very long time afterwards. I would say a BSc is important that you should do it. Mm, mm. I, think. I think. It's not essential, it's not, you know, like, but having a BSc will help for a very long time. That is yeah. points that you will get every year, yeah. year on year, applying for jobs. I would do it if you can. And if you can do an even higher degree, like an MD... Uh, MSc, I think some unis they let you intercalate an MSc or like an MRes. 100% do it. 100%. Um, I think that the one I really, oh, sorry, I really want to talk about this one because I think it's important to what I was saying um, about someone is saying not being as a, from, so someone being from a not financially privileged background. What would be your advice to overcome these hurdles? I think it's really difficult because you know I was, for example, I was able to to take a year out and focus on academic stuff. But perhaps if I needed the money, I wouldn't be able to do so. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any advice. Because I think I talked about this in detail. Uh, Adam, any any suggestions? I mean, in a, uh, looking at the surface level of things, no, it doesn't disadvantage you being from a disadvantaged background on a kind of in a kind of superficial way. You don't have to pay anything to email a supervisor and spend two or three hours a week doing a project. But your time as a med student is free and your most valuable asset. And actually, it's probably more, most valuable even after you graduate. So if you're someone that has dependents, if you're working another job, as I knew a few med students who did, if you have a family, if for whatever reason you need to spend time making money, you are go I think you are going to be disadvantaged. And the truth is that um, if you look at the points that you need to get specialty training, 
Um, I've spoken to lots of trainees who say you can basically just buy your way in. You can buy lots of the things that you need to get points. You can pay £700 for that course. You can pay £100 for that nice leather bounded you know, portfolio. You can actually pay for papers as well. Um, there's a thing called, uh, which some of you may know about, called open access. Well, essentially, a journal could be very, very low ranking in terms of impact factor. You could take something that's not particularly impactful or meaningful or important and just pay the open access fee and you'll get published. So, unfortunately, I think there are ways to pay your way into the system. Um, and I guess by extension, if you don't have that kind of financial, enough financial freedom to spend a few hours a week working on an extracurricular project, that's going to put you down a bit. So I think, I think Adam covers a very, very important point, and it's very much, it's very, very pertinent in surgery where there's a lot of courses, a lot of things that are mandatory that are very expensive. Um, the courses that you need to take for surgical training, the ATLS is a thousand pounds, looking at basic surgical skills, another 600 pounds, and those things are all mandatory. You don't, you don't necessarily get them approved for on study leave. Um, and it's very true, there's publications or papers you can get submitted, open access that you pay for, get your name on the, and get essentially published on the PubMed. Um, so yes, you're right if you're disadvantaged, but then at the very same time, you are studying in the UK, you are in a good university, you have a good research background, there are people in your university that will have publications that they're turning out that are high impact. And it's about finding those people and aligning with them and working with them. Um, I was at UCL and there were a lot of great people that I could have worked with here and I, I unfortunately went to the US and I was privileged in the fact because I had family out there but um, it's by no, no means what you have to do. Um, you can stay directly in university, find the right people, connect with them, just like I did, sending emails, uh, asking to have a video call or a conference call, um, and showing your interest locally. Um, and it's a low risk for them because they know you're a medical student at their university. And it's a um, high win for you because you're not going anywhere. It's, uh, it's no cost at all. Um, so, there are things you can do to kind of bypass those disadvantages. So I think, um, I think we should probably stop there guys. Um, because I think lots of the questions uh, are, they're very sort of, how do I get into this? How do I get to that? We're sort of, we're veering off our sort of chosen topic. But I think it's cool because now we know what people want to hear about. So maybe we can use this sort of chat and Q and A for developing some more stuff. So maybe things like AFP, uh, a foundation program, uh, how to sort of go about doing intercalated BSCs, for example. I think it's all really interesting stuff and there's, you know, lots of people are interested. So maybe we'll do another session, um, but please do fill out the feedback for myself and the other speakers and study hub because it will allow us to use it for our own portfolio and then we can develop ways of improving this platform, improving these webinars and hopefully uh, it was a useful experience. So thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Savannah from study hub. Um, and so really, really hope you enjoyed this. We really did as well. And uh, we'll see you next time. And we'll record this and put this up on our YouTube channel, hopefully tomorrow. Okay.